For this video, I'm going to be discussing what is a clock inside of an FPGA. A clock is really the heart of your FPGA design, so let's get into it. First of all, a clock. It's not like an analog clock or a digital clock. It's a square wave. A square wave that has a 50% duty cycle wave. 50% meaning it's got an equal number of on time as to off time. Half the time specifically it's on, half the time it's off. On being one, off being zero. And the clock is really what drives your FPGA design. And I'll get into exactly why that is. Um, but it determines how fast your FPGA can run. So, you know, a uh, high-end FPGA runs in the hundreds of megahertz, maybe like 200 megahertz is probably pretty quick, probably starting to push the limits of um, traditional FPGA design. Um, you know, you can certainly get faster than that with dedicated pieces of logic, but like in the tens to hundred megahertz is usually where you are most comfortable operating in an FPGA. Um, the, the faster you clock your design, the faster your main clock for your design, the faster you can process data and chunk through data. Some designs might require a really fast clock. It might require a lot of data to be processed. Other designs, you could run them at, you know, 100 hertz and it would probably be fine. So it really depends on what you, what your requirements are, what you really need to do. Um, and it's a complicated thing to suss out, but uh, clocks in general drive all sequential logic in your design. An FPGA can either have combinational logic or sequential logic. Combinational logic is gates, AND gates, NAND gates, that's a good one, OR gates. Uh, those are combinational pieces of circuits. Those don't require a clock. A lot of the time you can use a clock with those pieces of logic, but they're not required. Um, but sequential logic does require a clock. So flip-flops, FFs there. RAMs, random access memories, ROMs, FIFOs, those all require a clock in order to work correctly. Um, and just one thing to note is that you can have multiple clock domains in a single FPGA. Um, I will say this now, but you know you don't you don't need to have multiple clock domains. And if you're a beginner, I would recommend trying to avoid it as much as possible because it does make things more complicated. So the way a clock works inside of an FPGA is that um, there's usually an external oscillator, a dedicated component on your circuit board that generates that 50% duty cycle wave. And it comes into the FPGA on one pin, usually. Uh, so here, this black square is the pin, physical pin, that the clock signal comes in on. And it's a special pin. It's usually dedicated. Um, and the reason it's special and the reason it's dedicated is that it goes to special places inside your FPGA. Specifically, it goes to this clock tree, is what it's called. And the purpose of the clock tree network is to distribute the clock via dedicated routing signals throughout your design um, to all of the flip-flops in your design. And there's different... You can have multiple clock trees. You can have, um, you know, multiple. There's all sorts of different configurations when it comes to the clocks, and each FPGA is different. But this is the general idea. Let's say you just have one clock. This is what it would look like. Um, it would go to all of the clock inputs to all the flip flops on your design. The little arrow is the clock input to a flip flop. And if you don't know what a flip flop is, just stop this video and go watch the video about flip flops, because um, that's an extremely important thing to understand before you start getting into FPGA design as well. And the dedicated, logic, the dedicated routing logic is used to minimize skew. Skew is the difference in time um, from when the clock arrives at one flip-flop to when it arrives at another flip-flop. You really want that clock, that clock pulse to arrive to all of the flip-flops in the entire FPGA at, if you could, the exact same time. You can't exactly get the exact same time, but you can get pretty, pretty good. Um, the routing logic inside of FPGAs is good enough that it's almost instantaneous. It's almost the same time for all the all the flip-flops. And where it's not instantaneous, the tools will actually tell you. They'll take care of that. So you can tell the tools, I'm running at a 50 megahertz clock domain, and they'll be able to do, um, during the place and route process specifically, tell you if, you, if your FPGA design is going to meet timing. So it, it knows things about SKU throughout your design. So you don't need to worry about that. Uh, but this is it, you know, your clock, your clock is what drives all your flip-flops. And that's really the flip-flops are the workhorses of the FPGA. They make everything happen. They're the sequential pieces of logic. They store state inside your FPGA. And you can think of a clock as like this, this enormous gear that kind of 
turns every single flip-flop all at the same time. They all go ka-chunk, and they go to the next state. Ka-chunk, go to the next state. The rising edge is always what's used for the clock, almost always, 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, use the rising edge of the clock to just chunk, chunk the flip-flop, make the flip-flop do the next thing, do the next thing, do the next thing. And the entire FPGA design, this is why FPGAs are different from processors, right? A processor is operating on one instruction at a time. It's doing it really fast, but it's only one thing at a time. In an FPGA, every single flip-flop is potentially changing its state on every single rising edge of the clock. The whole thing is just ka-chunk, 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 chunk it along, all in parallel. It's a completely different way of thinking about things, so it, it takes some time to get used to. I mentioned that you can have multiple clocks inside of an FPGA. Um, I also mentioned that I don't recommend that for beginners, and uh, a lot of the times beginners think that they need external uh, multiple clocks. You don't often need multiple clocks. It's really unique circumstances where you might need multiple clocks. Usually you can pick one clock domain, 50 megahertz, or in the Go board it's a 25 megahertz clock. And you can run almost, you can run tons of stuff off that. You can run the UART, you can run the SPY off that, a lot of external things, a VGA, you can run a lot of stuff off of one clock domain without having to worry about generating another clock domain. Um, in general, it's usually external stuff that requires another clock domain. So for example, SDRAM, that's like DDR2, DDR3, that usually requires a dedicated clock domain. Um, any camera, so I've done some work with like night vision, night vision cameras, thermal cameras. Um, I've done some work uh, with visible cameras. Any of that stuff usually requires, the camera itself says like I need this very specific clock frequency. And so you might need to generate that very specific clock frequency to make the camera run correctly. Or if you have a special sensor, maybe a, uh, something special, some special external component. The whole point though is that these are usually, all, it's usually only needed for external stuff. You don't often need to generate a bunch of internal clocks just for the hell of it. You know, usually just pick one, stick to it. Um, but if you do need an external clock, uh, I'm sorry, if you do need uh, multiple clocks, your phase lock loop or PLL inside your FPGA is the place where you go to generate that. And the way, super high level, the way a PLL works is it takes in a reference clock, whatever clock you have, 50 megahertz, let's say, and it'll actually uh, generate, spin it up and generate in some really high frequency, like in the gigahertz range, um, hundreds of megahertz, if not gigahertz, and then it will actually tap off that and divide it down to whatever clock you need. Um, so you can get totally arbitrary clock frequencies based on a 50 megahertz input, for example. You could get like 67.26, you know, you would never think that you could, but you can. It's pretty cool. Um, and the PLL is where you do that. But in general, you really don't need multiple clocks, and this is a super common point for confusion for beginners. Um, and I'm gonna show you uh, how you might want to take a single clock and uh, do something, run something at a slower frequency with that one clock. So for example, let's say, let's say you have a UART, which is a way to communicate with a computer. And those operate at like 57, six, or 19,200 baud, uh, 19,200 bits per second. So you might think, oh, I need like a 19 kilohertz, 19.2 kilohertz clock, dedicated clock just to run the UART. Not true, you do not need that. You can use a 50 megahertz clock and just count a bunch of times and only do things um, every so often. So you can just use a, a counter and a clock enable signal to just tell you when to do things in the design. And I've actually, if you look up a NANLAND UART, that's exactly what I do. I count to like 246, and when I get to 246, I say, okay, that's the baud rate that I'm looking for, go do the thing. Hard to explain right now, but go look at the code for the NANLAND UART and you'll understand. Um, but I do wanna show you another example, which is like, assuming I have uh, an analog digital converter. So, um, assuming I have a, an analog digital converter that runs at, the data sheet tells me it, need, it needs to be driven with a 10 megahertz clock. So the FPGA needs to generate a 10 megahertz clock, okay. But the main input clock to my FPGA, let's assume it's 40 megahertz. So you might think, oh, I need to generate a new clock uh, of 10 megahertz with like a PLL or something. You could do that, but you definitely do not need to do that. That's overkill in complexity for what you need to do. 
The best way to solve this here is to use your 40 megahertz clock and just do things every so often via a clock enable signal. So I'll go through some code here. So this is an ADC interface, it's made up, it's not real. Um, but let's say I have an input clock at 40 megahertz and I wanna generate, this is the you know, 10 megahertz output clock here, um, ADC clock. I'm gonna have a clock enable signal, which is gonna be low by default, and a, a four bit, uh, sorry, two bit clock count, and just some test signal here. And what I'm gonna do is, Always at pause edge, this is Verilog, and sorry for the HDL people if you guys haven't seen this before, but I think this is close to C, so you'll probably get the gist of it. Always at pause edge, I clock 40 megahertz, do this stuff. This is a always block. So I can assign the clock enable to zero by default and just look at this clock count signal. And if it's equal to zero, I'm gonna set the ADC clock to zero. Else, if it's equal to two, I'm gonna set it to one. So this means that when clock count is zero and one, ADC clock is gonna be low, and when clock count is two and three, ADC clock is gonna be high. So what this means is that you're gonna go one, two, it's gonna be low, I'm sorry, zero, one, low, two, three, high. Zero, one, low, two, three, high. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna take the 40 megahertz main clock of your FPGA and generate a 10 megahertz um, signal that's going to be used to drive the ADC. Now, I wanna make this clear that this ADC clock is not being used internally. This signal OADC clock never gets used internally inside the FPGA. That is a super common point of confusion for beginners where you might, you might generate some signal like ADC clock and you go, oh, it's a 10 megahertz signal, so I can use it now. And it's a 10 megahertz clock, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it in uh, the sensitivity list to my always blocks. Terrible idea. And the reason is that signal is the output of a flip-flop. A flip-flop has a D input, Q output. That signal comes, the, comes off the Q of a flip-flop. And if you wanna all of a sudden drive the Q of a flip-flop to the clock input to another flip-flop, now you have, you're not using dedicated clock routing anymore, that dedicated clock tree that I showed you before. You're not on the clock tree anymore. And you, it depends on how the FPGA works and how the synthesis tools works, but it's really unreliable. It's not a great way, it's a terrible way to, to do it. And you don't need to do it. It makes things way more complicated. So the timing tools are gonna have problems when they try to tell you how many timing errors you have. Um, so if you ever generate a clock like this, don't use it. If it's the output of a flip-flop, which this one is here, do not use it into, inside your FPGA. Uh, you can use it outside your FPGA, that's fine. But inside, what you wanna do, so this is showing two things. One, it's showing how to generate a clock that goes external. That's this ADC clock. And two, it's showing you how to use, uh, how to divide any clock by some whole number. Uh, so in this case, uh, our clock enable is only gonna pulse high one clock cycle when our clock count is equal to two. Otherwise, our clock enable is gonna be zero. And that is what we're going to use to actually uh, generate signals that, are, that change every 10 megahertz. So down here, let's uh, scroll down a little bit so you can see. So down here in this always block, this is really the one that's gonna be generating signals for the ADC. So internally, we use our uh, clock enable. We never use the output of a flip-flop as an internal clock, like I said before. So we still use our main 40 megahertz clock to drive this always block. But the one thing we're doing here is we're gonna be checking to see if our clock enable is equal to one. This is shorthand for saying equals equals one tick be one. And you're only going to run this logic in this if statement if this clock enable is true, which is gonna be true one time out of every four clocks. So effectively, it's only gonna be true every 10 megahertz. So effectively, this always block is running at 10 megahertz. It's being clocked with a 40 megahertz clock, but effectively, it's only changing every 10 megahertz. And that is a super important thing that a lot of beginners miss, um, because they'll, like I said, they'll try to generate some clock with some always block and then use that new clock somewhere else, don't do that. You use one clock in your design and use clock enables to actually chunk through the data. You know, you could, 
if you if your if your ADC changed and you went to a a 20 megahertz AD, ADC, you know, this always block would look exactly the same. It's just the frequency of our clock enable would double. Or if you went to a 40 megahertz ADC, our clock enable would always be high and it would run the exact same. So that's the beauty of clock enable too, is that your code pretty much stays the same. The only thing that changes is how often that clock enable gets pulsed. And so I did simulate this code so you can actually see it. On, on this fantastic website called edaplayground.com. Uh, I got some feedback in one of the other videos that people really like examples. So here's, here's an example that shows you what I'm talking about here. Um, this is a little test bench I threw together that just shows the code here. And you can see our clock running at uh, some, some high frequency. And the ADC clock is running at four times slower. So one, two, three, four. This is the frequency, let's see, do I have cursors on this? Yeah. Huh. So here is the beginning of an ADC clock period. Here's one half of the, here's the, the right, uh, the, when it, the ADC clock is high, here's when the ADC clock is low, and that's four clock cycles. So now I've, I've effectively, that's the first half, divided the clock by four and sent it out to the ADC. Um, and then internally, I'm using the R clock enable signal, which is just one pulse every four clock cycles. So here's the pulse right here. And then it's low for one, two, three clocks, high for one clock cycle, low for one, two, three clocks. And I just have R test enable, just only incrementing this R test signal here. It increments once every time the clock enable is high, just to show you that it's actually operating at 10, effectively 10 megahertz. So that's how you deal with um, a single clock domain inside your FPGA when you think you, when you might think you need two or three or four. If you in fact do need multiple clock domains, and like I said, there are certainly ways when you need multiple clock domains. You know, if you have any uh, high speed serial stuff, CERTES things, almost certainly you need another clock domain. Um, any memory interfaces that are high-speed memory interfaces, yes. Um, and a lot of peripherals. If you have peripherals that require a super specific clock, then you, you probably need it. And you will, in almost all those situations that I just named, you will need to know how to cross clock domains effectively and very carefully. And crossing clock domains is a tricky subject, and it's not one that I think I can tag on this video. Um, I did write an article about it. I think it's it goes into a pretty, a pretty good amount of detail on how to cross clock domains inside of an FPGA. There's a few different scenarios. If you're going from a slow domain to a fast domain, if you're going from a fast domain to a slow domain, if you're sending a lot of data back and forth between two clock domains, and there's different scenarios and there's different approaches for each one of those. So if you need to know how to do that, check out that link there, and I will put that in the description for the YouTube video as well. Oh, and I will also put the... Um, the code on the EDA playground that I showed you, I will put that in the in the uh, bottom of the YouTube video as well, so you guys can check it out. It's publicly available. That's it for what is a clock inside of an FPGA. I hope that's been helpful for you guys. Um, I really appreciate everybody's support. Again, the best way to support this YouTube channel and to keep me making these videos is to purchase yourself a Nanland Go board if you haven't yet already done so. And for those of you who have, I really appreciate it. It's the best way to keep me going. So thank you.